Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for coming back. What we've been talking about in the last series of lectures are case control study designs, the big picture. You start out with people who already have an outcome, already have a disease. Those are your cases. And what you want to do is imagine the source population, the cohort study, where they came from. Some cohort that existed in the past that, if followed over time, would have yielded the same cases as the outcomes from that cohort study. And, we, and, the, and we've been mentioning the whole purpose of the controls in a case control study is to estimate the exposure characteristics, the distribution of exposure in that source population, in that underlying cohort study. Now, first we started talking about underlying cohort studies that were well defined. They were existing pre-performed cohort studies. And what you were doing is coming along after the cohort study was finished, taking the outcomes, calling them your cases, and selecting controls from that cohort to answer a different hypothesis by collecting information that was not collected originally in the cohort study. And we used an example done by Walter Willett looking at the relationship between selenium levels and your risk of developing cancer using data from a previous randomized trial, the hypertension detection and follow-up study. Then we moved on to the more general situation where your cases are not the outcomes of a previously performed documented cohort study, but cases that were detected or diagnosed perhaps at, in a particular hospital or a series of hospitals or in some geographic area, and the underlying cohort was more loosely defined in your brain. You knew it existed, but you didn't have documentation about who was in that cohort and how many people were followed. And what I left uh, talking about in the last section was the, was the more common type of that general cohort study known as the density type uh, case control study. So let me start with an example where the disease, the outcome we're looking at is something called aortic stenosis. Well, for you, those of you who are not clinicians, I went onto Wikipedia and just looked at the definition of aortic stenosis, and it states that it is a disease of the heart valves, that's what we're talking about, which are the, uh, in which the opening uh, of the aortic valve, one of those valves, is narrowed. Now, the aortic valve is the valve between the left ventricle of your heart and the aorta. Now, it's the largest of the arteries. The aorta is the largest of the arteries of the, of the body. And we're talking about the valve connecting the aorta to the, the, to the left ventricle of your heart. And the problem is the purpose of that valve is to open and close to allow blood to flow through into your left ventricle and to close so it doesn't flow back out. And aortic stenosis deals with a malformation of that valve, a disease of that valve in which the valve is narrowed, less blood can flow through. Well. A number of years ago, I had the pleasure of working with a cardiology fellow at our hospital who was doing a study looking at the risk factors of aortic stenosis. And he wanted to collect data for an entirely different purpose than what I'm going to be showing you today. His motivation was to try to, uh, to identify risk factors that could be combined into what is known as a prediction rule that could estimate a person's risk of having this condition, aortic stenosis, based on these commonly measured risk factors. The advantage of having that prediction rule is it might avoid having to do the very invasive test known as cardiac catheterization, which is the gold standard for detecting aortic stenosis, in which a catheter is placed into your body and, and wound into the location of the aortic valve to examine that valve. Well, during the process of that study, my colleague said, you know, friend, no one really knows what really are the risk factors for aortic stenosis. I've been collecting these data on people who I know have this disease. I've been reviewing what is known as the cath reports, the historical records of people who underwent cardiac catheterization at our hospital. And he identified 105 subjects who had documentation of having aortic stenosis. Now, he suspected that the same risk factors that cause coronary artery disease, things like smoking, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, family history of heart disease, may also be risk factors for causing this particular condition known as aortic stenosis. And he said to me, I have these 105 people who I know have the disease. I've been reviewing a lot of other uh, uh, cath reports to identify these 105 cases, so I have other people 
who based on their cardiac catheterization do not have the disease. Don't I have a case control study looking at me? I have 105 people who have the disease. I have other people who I know don't have the disease. I have their medical records. I can see if there's any mention of them being smokers or having diabetes or having high blood pressure or high cholesterol levels or having a family history of coronary heart, or, coronary heart disease. Can I use these data to, to answer the question, what are the risk factors for aortic stenosis? Can I do a case control study? Well, we thought about it for a few minutes, and we discussed the advantages and the disadvantages of using the data set that he had. And at the end of the day, we decided to go ahead and analyze these data to, as if they were a case control study, but we also added another uh, set of data to this data set because we thought there were problems in his original data that we'll discuss as I go through this example. So this is what my colleague's data set looked like. Remember, he has 105 people underwent cardiac catheterization, documented aortic stenosis. Those are your cases. As far as controls, remember the purpose of the controls. They are people who try to describe the underlying cohort that existed in the past, that if followed over time, would have yielded those 105 cases of aortic stenosis as the outcomes of that cohort study. Well, he had three candidate groups to serve as potential control groups. We'll call them group one, group two, and group three. Group one contains 110 people. They underwent cardiac catheterization. They, their aortic valve was, was uh, examined. It didn't, they did not have aortic stenosis. They were free of that disease. But they had another type of valvular heart disease. One of their other valves in their hearts was disease, was damaged in some sense. So what I want you to think about, are those 110 people appropriate to use as controls to compare to your 105 cases? Do they reflect that underlying cohort? And do they reflect the smoking history, the hypertension history, the cholesterol history, et cetera, of that underlying cohort that gave rise to your 105 cases? So think about that. He had another potential control group. Let's call that control group number two. 170 different people. They also underwent cardiac catheterization. We knew they did not have aortic stenosis. And they had no problems with any of their valves, no valvular disease whatsoever. They had no art coronary artery disease either. So you might start thinking, why were these people uh, referred for cardiac catheterization in the first place? They end up not having any disease. Cardiac catheterization is not a random event. It, it re requires a referral uh, from a physician that this test is going to be meaningful. So realize these 170 people were referred for cardiac catheterization, and the cardiac catheterization showed no disease, no valvular disease, no artery disease. Are those 170 people appropriate to use as your, as your controls to compare to the exposure histories of the 105 cases? And then finally, had a third group. This was the group that he originally did not collect. This was the group he collected after we had our discussion, after we were hemming and hawing, deciding whether we had the makings of a good case control study using either group one or using group two. He had another 269 people who were not referred for cardiac catheterization. We don't know whether they had aortic stenosis or not. That's one of the problems with this third control group. They were people who underwent surgery at our hospital. Surgery that for a disease, as far as we know, was not caused or prevented by smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, um, family history of heart disease, any of the factors that we were looking at as potential risk factors for aortic stenosis. Is group three an appropriate control group? That's what I'd like you to be thinking about as we go through this example. So let me tell you some more problems with this data set, with this study. This study was done on a budget of zero dollars, no money whatsoever. My colleague, the lead author, Dr. Peter Hoagland, collected all this data on his own. No patients were interviewed. All he did was sit in a record room and review medical records. Now, this was a number of years ago, prior to the time we had electronic medical records. So Dr. Hoagland was doing a lot of paper reading, looking for information in people's records if they were smokers or if they had hypertension or family history of heart disease. So one source, the one problem is the source was medical records, and if the medical records said this person was a smoker, 
Dr. Hoagland labeled that person as a smoker. If the, if the record said this person was a non-smoker, he labeled him as a non-smoker. But the, if there was no mention whatsoever about smoking, Dr. Hoagland made the decision, the assumption, that that meant that that person was not a smoker. We assumed they were non-exposed if no information was even cited in the medical record. We're assuming that if a risk factor was asked, and if the answer was that a risk factor was present, it would have been documented. And, pr and no documentation, we were assuming meant the question was asked and the answer was no, but the, and the investigator decided, or the person, person filling out the medical record decided it wasn't important to mention. But this leads to a potential of measurement error, measurement bias. There's a potential for misclassification here. Some, for example, some of our non-smokers are based on there being no mention of smoking in the medical record, and who knows, maybe they were actually smokers. Maybe the information was never recorded because it was never asked. Okay, so keep that in mind. There are problems with this data. Well, here's an example of one of the analyses you could do with Dr. Holden's data. This is looking at control group number three. Those are the people who didn't undergo cardiac catheterization. We'll talk about their merits in a few minutes. But the, uh, those were people who came to the hospital, our hospital, because they underwent some type of surgery, not expected to be related to any of these risk factors. This is looking at the risk factor hypertension. We have 105 cases. Of those 105 cases, their medical records show that 43 of them had documentation of hypertension, and 62 did not. Of the 269 individuals in control group number three, 91 of those people had a history of hypertension mentioned in their medical records, and 178 did not. Remember, in a case control study, what we're asking about among the cases and the controls is their previous exposures, in this case, previous history of hypertension. The way we build an association between the previous risk factor hypertension and the presence or absence of disease, the case and controls in this case, is we calculate an exposure odds ratio. We measure the, the odds of exposure among the cases. We look down the column of the cases and we say the odds of being a hypertensive individual would be the number of hypertensive, 43, divided by the number of non-hypertensive, 62. We compare that to the same calculation among the controls. We look down the control column, we look at the odds of exposure, the odds of hypertension among them, it would be 98 over 178, and we take the ratio of those two odds to get an exposure odds ratio. Now in the previous lectures, I've been making a big point that that's the calculation we do. But then we go a step further to interpret those exposure odds ratios as measures of association that we would have seen in the underlying cohort study from which these 105 cases developed. Well, in this case, our cases came from one hospital. The source population, the cohort study that gave us those cases is probably some very open, dynamic population that existed in the past in which people are moving in and moving out of. But if any of them developed the signs or symptoms of aortic stenosis and saw their physicians, their physicians would have referred them to our hospital, they would have undergone cardiac catheterization, and they would have been outcomes in that cohort study. So what this exposure odds ratio is hopefully estimating approximately is a rate ratio, the incidence rate ratio that would have existed in that underlying open or dynamic cohort study that gave us these 105 cases. That's the calculations, that's the results. Now before we interpret this as being a valid result, and that's when we have to talk about the appropriateness of control group three, let me say a few things about case control studies and other calculations that you cannot usually do in case control studies. The, what the biggest, one of the biggest drawbacks of case control studies is they do not allow you to answer the question, what's the risk of aortic stenosis among people who have hypertension? What's the risk of aortic stenosis among people who don't have, have hypertension? Or what's the incidence rate of aortic stenosis in those groups? Yes, you can get a measure of association. You can, you can get an exposure odds ratio. You can interpret it, hopefully, as a rate ratio. But what you don't know are the individual rates of disease for the exposed group, the hypertensive people, and the non-exposed group, the non-hypertensive people. So what case control studies typically do not and that's what I want to stress here, do not allow, is to have exposure-specific risks or rates. 
And the reason is because we, the investigator, decided how many diseased people to have in our data set and how many non-diseased people. My colleague, Dr. Hoagland, decided he could find 105 cases of aortic stenosis. He ended up enrolling, if I go back to the previous slide, 269 controls, if you wanted to use control three. So the ratio of number of diseased people, 105, to number of non-diseased people, 269, in these data was determined by the investigator. He could have had twice as many controls and would have had a different data set. So does the fact that the investigator is determining the relative sizes of the cases and the controls, essentially determining how much disease and non-disease is in this data set, that causes us a problem of typically not being able to estimate risks and rates because the overall prevalence of the outcome in the data set is not determined by nature as, we were, as if you were doing a cohort study, following people and seeing how many people develop the disease. It's been determined by the, by the investigator, and as a result, it does not truly reflect the risk or the rate of disease that exists in some general population. And to try to, strive, to drive that home, let's go back and try to estimate, if we could, risks of developing aortic, from, aortic stenosis from these data. So let me first go back to the table itself. Let me get rid of my red scribbling for the time being to make it a little bit simpler. Okay, so let's look at this data and see if we could estimate risks of developing aortic stenosis among the people with hypertension and maybe among the people with non-hypertension. So in the data set itself, we have 43 people among the cases who have hypertension, and another 91 among the controls. We have 43 plus 91. We have 134 individuals in this data set with hypertension, 43 of which have this condition, aortic stenosis. Among the non-hypertensives, we have 62 from the case group, 178 from the non-case, the controls group. We have another 240 without hypertension, of which 62 of them have the condition of aortic stenosis. If this were a cohort study, we could look across the top row and say among everybody who had hypertension, the 134, what proportion of those had the disease? Well, it would be 43 have the disease, so it would be 43 over 134. So we could go through the calculation at least, calculate 40, the what is the formula for the cumulative incidence, the formula for the incidence for the estimated risk, and say 32% of the people with hypertension in this data set have aortic stenosis. And similarly, if we looked on the second row, the people without hypertension, it would turn out that 26% of those people have the condition of aortic stenosis. Well, that's using the formula for calculating estimated risks, cumulative incidence. But are those numbers meaningful? Are they valid? Well, to think about it, let's suppose we did a study using the same 105 cases that Dr. Hoagland had. But for his control group three, let's suppose he wanted twice as large a control group, essentially having um, twice as many people with hypertension among the control group and twice as many people uh, without hypertension among the control group. If I go back to his original table, remember he had 269 people in the original control series, twice that would mean he'd have 538. Twice as many people with, with hypertension, twice as many people without hypertension. Notice if I calculated the exposure odds ratio on this new case control data set using the same cases before, but essentially counting each control that I had before twice, notice that the ex odds of exposure among the cases is the same. Notice that the odds now among the, of exposure among the controls is the same. Twice as, many number, twice as many people in the numerator, twice as many people in the denominator, but the same exposure odds. The exposure odds ratio stays the same as 1.4. But does these estimated risks that I tried to calculate before, are they staying the same? Well, now in this study, I have 43 people with hypertension among the case group. I have 182 now among the control group. In total, I now have 225 people with hypertension in this data set. Again, 43 of them having aortic stenosis. Can I do the calculation? Divide 43 by 225 now to estimate a person's risk of having aortic stenosis. 
Well, notice the number changes from what it was before. The same thing if I do the calculation for people without hypertension, the number changes. The number is meaningless because what I as the investigator have control of is the number of people in the case column, the control column, and that affects these calculations. So what I cannot do from case control study is, is to do what I could do in cohort studies. I cannot tell the individual's exposed group what their risks, cumulative incidences are, or incidence rates. All I can measure from case control studies are relative measures exposure odds ratios and interpret those as risk ratios or rate ratios. Those are, that is a limitation of case control study design. Well, there is a way to fix the problem by using Bayes' theorem, what Marcello talked about. If you knew something about the underlying risk of disease in the population, you could use Bayes' theorem to, from the case control study, estimate risks for exposed and non-exposed people. But you'd have to have another piece of information. Essentially, the, the underlying risk or incidence of disease in the entire population to be able to, to do that. And that's what is typically not available in data like these. Okay, let me show you the other problems with case control study using this data as an example. Let's talk about now about biases. Case control studies are sometimes referred to as quick and dirty studies. Quick because you don't have to wait for people to develop disease as you have to do in a prospective cohort study. They are more efficient, less expensive in terms of time and money. You just have to collect the data that has already happened in the past. People today are diseased and with aortic stenosis or without aortic stenosis. We asked in their medical records whether they were smokers or not. But they're dirty meaning of all the study designs in general, they're the most prone to biases. Remember, there were two types of biases. Selection biases, selecting the wrong people from your study, and measurement biases, measuring incorrect information on people. Selection biases is the big problem in case control studies. It de deals with the selection of the controls. It deals with the fact that the controls are supposed to answer the question, how common was the exposure in this in this previously defined cohort study that might only loosely exist in your brain. That's the purpose of the controls to say how much smoking existed in the past in the cohort study that gave me these 105 cases of aortic stenosis. How much hypertension existed in the past? So we would love to have a random sample of that pre-existing cohort study, but we don't know who was in it. And we're trying to select a group of people who hopefully reflect that population and reflect the, the prevalence of exposure in that population. That's the big problem. So let's talk about this study and the potential for selection bias. Well, first let's talk about control group number one. Control group number one, remember, were people who did not have aortic stenosis. That's good. We un they underwent cardiac catheterization and the aortic valve was fine. But they had another disease in one of their other valves. And how do we know the risk factors that cause aortic stenosis are not causing that other disease and that other valves also? So it may well be that smoking causes both conditions. So when you use control group one as your control group, you are assuming their smoking history reflects that of the baseline population, the cohort that gave rise to the 105 cases, and maybe if smoking co 